some books. Every video has to start out with me I'm standing here looking like a dummy because I'm out here too early. But if you would uh, turn off your cell phones, you know the drill, kids. Um, next, I'm sorry, this Thursday we're starting our yoga, very a highly experimental program for us at 7 p.m. here in this room. We'll have the tables out. We'll bring your mat if you signed up and you can be here. Bring a mat if you have one. If you're registered but can't make it to this class or any of the future ones, let us know because we have people on a wait list who would like to come and try. And uh, so that'll be Thursday. Next week, Mark Archman will be here and we will read from Timothy Russell's posthumous poetry book, In Plenta Vita, The Full Life. Uh, he was known as the steel-making poet, or some, something to that effect. He worked at Weird and Steel, with Bob Villamagna, among others. We'll have several people here who were friends of his reading from the book. And on February 6th, they all became heroes, the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Infantry. Our friend Pete Chakalos' new book will be here to discuss that. How many of you have ever posted a, or shared a post that you didn't know, you didn't check or bother to check if it was true or not? Just because it's cool or whatever. Yeah, we, I think we've all done that. I only saw maybe a third of you raise your hands, but if you're using Facebook, you're sharing posts that probably aren't true. Another thing you have to be leery of these days is artificial intelligence. I don't know if we'll address that today, but someone asked me to just talk about the fact that people are being conned because they can mimic someone's voice and say that your, your daughter or someone and they're in distress in California somehow, although you know they're in Shadyside, Ohio, but somehow they got to California because it sounds just like them and you, they need to, you to send them $10,000 right away. Over and put them in. Look out for that. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Uh, and, and it's uh, getting worse every day. Uh, but this is National News Literacy Week, and uh, that's a nonprofit organization, nonpartisan nonprofit organization, uh, designed to advance the practice of news literacy, meaning uh, improving democracy by uh, understanding the role of a free press and empowering people to take a more active role in the civic life of their country. So I brought in an expert. Dr. Bob Britton is an associate professor at the WVU Reed College of Media. He's worked as a reporter, uh, graphics reporter, designer, art director, ed editorial director, all sorts of things. He's a freelance writer and uh, he's worked at newspapers and magazines and he's earned, earned his BA from Allegheny College in Meadville, PA his master's and doctorate in journalism from the University of Missouri. His areas of interest are visual communication, rhetoric and culture, and the role these play in building and maintaining social memory. He currently teaches visual communication and news design courses at WVU. Please welcome Bob Britt. Hi, uh, good afternoon. It's like two minutes afternoon, so good noon. Um, like you said, yeah, so I, I teach WVU in College of Media. We're going to be uh, merging with Creative Arts, so it's going to have a really long, longer name, but, but that's where I'm from. Um, anyway, he'd, he'd start off by, uh, trying to start off by asking that question of who's ever shared something and then uh, uh, that turned out not to be true. And that, that's something where, you know, we often want to cop to, but let me ask it a different way. Who's ever seen something that somebody whose judgment they generally trust, person, not like a news organization, that you felt might not be true. That I feel like we should get more hands for. I don't ask people to out themselves like, oh, I shared something. But I've shared fake celebrity deaths before, so I'll, here's my hand. I've done this thing, and I teach this, so don't believe a word I say. Uh, but but the idea, you know, have you ever seen the thing of, and I, again, I won't ask if you've done it, but the thing of, I'm sharing this uh, as proof that Facebook can no longer use my images. You've seen that? Or, you know, you know, yeah, you know. Yeah, none of those things are real. You know, if I share this, Bill Gates will donate one dollar, that kind of thing. And you've been here. You, you've seen it. And again, I won't ask if it's you, because but I, I hope they can feel a little bit safer to acknowledge, like, yeah, I did that. 
because you all have done it and I all have done it and we all have done it. That's the thing and what we want to get to, so three things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, misinformation, disinformation, we'll get some, some slidey things. This is a little farther away than I'm used to, so if the text is small, don't worry. At the end, I have a link that I'll put up with a, with a QR code and everything that you can go to that uh, uh, any of the resources I share here I'll have access to for you if you're so inclined. You can also make money. Um, uh, the second part, we'll talk a little bit about what, where, how that persuasion works, why we want to believe those things, and maybe why you don't need to feel so terrible about yourself for having fallen for something. It's it's kind of a go forth and sin no more situation. And and the last part we want to get into is toolbox, uh, because we want to get out of our head the idea that we have to know everything, because that's a good throw up your hands approach to media, right? Uh, to look at the world like, well, I have to know about everything, so I'm never fooled again. Well, you're not going to. And so if you can develop a toolbox to get ourselves used to recognizing not everything in the media and knowing everything about it, but being able to recognize uh, your own talents, when I might have stopped thinking, uh, when I might be feeling the truth rather than knowing the truth. That, that, that's a toolbox we can use. And that's a lot smaller toolbox, which is, which is good. We want things that actually work. You know, if I come in here and say, well, go out and just learn everything about the world, that way you'll never get fooled again. You know, good luck, because I haven't done it yet. And I think you've got some experience on me. So let's look at what we can do. Uh, and you'll notice this is called Spot the Sharks. You know, there's a reason for this, because I'm going to leave my very favorite example. And if you've seen it before, just act surprised. Uh, but uh, let's see, i got to figure out how the computer works. Um, a logo, when I teach in all my classes, not just presentations like this, not just media literacy classes, but one uh, phrase we go back to is live every week like it's Shark Week. Uh, the, 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 the tighter catchphrase of that is the shark picture is always fake, which we will go into it, we'll talk about the danger of always, never stated. Has anybody ever seen this picture before? Out of curiosity? You you will at some point, or you might have seen it and glossed over it. So what, is it, what does this appear to be? Yes, it is. Where is that shark? Sure is, yeah, which is not generally where one sees a shark. Uh, any guesses as to what the situation this, this picture purports to depict is? So we got a shark, what looks like an eye. What? Well, I mean, yeah, except there's that rearview mirror right there. Right, right. It's a shark, ostensibly appears to be a shark. Make sure we got everybody's got visibility. Shark swimming up the highway in the middle of a flood. Now, this picture, uh, this is not the last time you'll see this picture in, in, in life. Even. Um, but this is, again, this is one of my favorite examples here. So, most recently, this is not the first time this shark picture has appeared. This is not the last time it will appear. But um, it's a high profile example. So, Ted Cruz, we're familiar with who Ted Cruz is, uh, Senator from Texas. Uh, this August, Tropical Storm Hillary, which hit Southern California, did significant damage. Um, this was, I'm just going to call it Twitter because I feel weird saying X. Uh, but this image was shared by uh, this person, Big Cat. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so you may know who Big Cat is, so you may not. A friend of mine out in LA just took this picture on the 405. Yes, all news and media outlets, you have permission to use this. Wild. A shark swimming up the middle of a flooded highway. My God, what an amazing story. Senator Ted Cruz, an elected official of the United States. Uh, this man happens to be Republican, easily can be shared by a Democrat, independent, somebody else. So it happens to be Republican in this case. But we can put the partisan hackles down because here we're interested in just a high profile person on the platform sharing this picture. Uh, so, again, okay, August 20th, uh, Senator Cruz retweets this image. Reality intervenes. Now, if you are a Twitter user, you can be forgiven for not being. I try to stay off it myself. Um, one thing that Twitter does, although it's changing now, is readers can flag things that they think. Uh, might be incomplete, might be misinformation, that kind of thing. And the more flags they get, the more likely you are to get some kind of documentation like this. So I apologize because that's tiny and blurry. But what the tweet shows underneath it, the, this is the original tweet from Big Cat. If you see the name underneath Barstool Big Cat. If you're familiar with Barstool at all, you might be getting an idea of where this is going. If not, strap in and hang on. But oh, too far, sorry. Um, got a flag underneath it. So readers added context they thought people might want to know. Uh, it originally appeared in 2011 after Hurricane Irene. The ho ho hoax also made the rounds in 2015 after Texas was hit heavy rains, 2016 during Hurricane Matthew, 2017 during Hurricane Harvey. This is all showing up in the warning that readers have posted. Um, and so when Senator Cruz retweeted that, that context appeared underneath it as well. Following that up, the senator, to, in my opinion, his credit, um, didn't just delete the, the post and pretend it never happened. Followed up and said, I'm told this is a joke. In LA, you never, oh, it's too far. Uh, in LA, you never know. Please, everyone, stay safe from the storm or otherwise. To which Big Cat responds, Who said it was a joke? It's a shark on the highway. It's as real as real can be. Look, I also have a shark in the mall. And 
there's that picture, which it may shock you to learn is not real. Um, Chris didn't delete the original, but Big Cat responded, if you are not familiar with Barstool Sports, it's, it's a legit sports site, but it's also tends to be kind of bro-y, humor-y, that kind of thing. And Big Cat in particular, who tweets real stuff about real sports, also, had, he and his followers are pretty commonly known for they're going to be posting jokes. If you know who the person is, you know he's posting jokes. Senator Cruz either wasn't, or this is what's likely, and this has nothing to do with political party, ideology, or anything. The fact of the matter is, a hurricane flooding enough to allow sharks to swim up the high is a good story. It's got nothing to do with political stripe or anything like that. It's got everything to do with the fact that as human beings, we like not. We like stories that are like, wow, that's unusual. And when you feel, wow, when you feel, what a story. Not as a journalist, not as somebody in the mass media or government or anything. As a person, as a human being, the brain stops working, let's say stops working optimally. Because then we're feeling the news instead of thinking about the news. And this is the unifier here. Whether you're Senator Ted Cruz or guy who works for a nationwide news site or just a person. That's where we start. Sir, or was that a hand or just a question? Yeah, do you have a question? Okay, sorry, I am wired because I teach at, uni at a university. When I see a hand that's anywhere near up, I say, yes, do you have a question? But that's, that's okay. Yeah. By the way, if you have a question, feel free to interrupt. I bounce around in this all over the place, so we probably won't show everything I have here. Um, ask the questions. It's far better to have an active presentation than just me nattering for the whole time. But why I start with this instead of you know, election misinformation or that kind of thing is because it's a shark swimming up the highway. Anybody can get behind that being an interesting story. Anybody can recognize what that poll might feel like if you saw that in one of your regular sources of information, not even news, information. There's that poll, even if you wouldn't act on it, of, huh, what a story. What a weird thing. We share stories that are novel, that are interesting, or we feel compelled to, even if we stop, wait a minute, that's not good. If you feel that pull, that's our first indicator. So the watch phrase that I always go to with my classes is always assume the, assume the shark picture is fake. I'm being figurative here, not literally a shark picture, but if you see a picture of a shark swimming up the middle of the highway, that's an unusual situation. And that's the kind of thing where as human beings, we are inclined to be like, I bet that, that's interesting. You're gonna feel that pull right there in the heart place. And that's our first indicator going on. So what we want to do with this is what could the senator or you or I or whoever have done differently? This is where we get into the focus of today, talking about media literacy. So again, media literacy, I'll give you some definitions so I can you know, earn what I'm paid for. Um, but, and so you have that as a reference. But media literacy, the idea that people should be able to understand, produce, and negotiate meanings. Culture made up of powerful images, words, and sounds. Blah. The idea that I can look at the media and speak it. If you are literate, it means you can read the thing. You can read something in that language if you're English literate. If you are math literate, you can look at a differential equation and say, oh yeah, I understand what that means. There's literacy in anything you can think of. Uh, not just reading literacy, although that's the one you think of. So if you're media literate, you understand that all media messages are constructed by someone for someone. Maybe you, maybe not you. Uh, and I want to be very clear about this. When we talk about the media, we are not talking about Fox and CNN. They're part of the media. We're talking about anybody who produces messages for others. If you've ever clicked a post or comment or even like button, congratulations, you're part of the media. You are. This is control that we have. You are contributing to signal. You are boosting somebody's, even if it's just that like button or that share button. You are contributing. You are part of the media. You are sharing information. Congratulations. Uh, if you have a bumper sticker that says, I hate the media, guess what? <laughs> That's you also. Um, I don't need to overstate that, but it is true because as we amplify the signal, we provide oxygen for the messages that are out there. We provide our own messages when we comment, when we respond, when we engage in any way. That doesn't mean don't engage. Just know that we are complicit. We play a role. We contribute to the media environment. We are part of it. When you click, when you watch, when you share, when you comment, you are part of that. Why I'm laying on that is to understand not shame on you. It would be shame on me too. But to understand that you are part of that environment. You are sending a message to your audience. The 12 people, if you're a very, if you're a very small Facebook group, the 12 people that follow you on Facebook are nonetheless receiving the things that you put up there. So yeah, you're medium too. A message flows through you to other people. We want to start from that because that role of us is important here. 
Because when we talk about media literacy, we're not just talking about how to defend yourself against the bad people. We're all sharing stuff, even if it's just that, hey, you know what? My pictures on Facebook aren't usable for other people. Like you're extending the reach of that message when you post that. Um, so we want to know what we're coming from here. Um, let me click forward to, there's two main areas of media literacy, protection and empowerment. Protection is that keep yourself safe from bad messages. And that's good. We want to focus on that. But the empower side is important too because it's, that mean, it's not just about keeping yourself safe in a dangerous world that has scary messages. It's about the fact that when you say something, you are amplifying someone. When you choose not to say something, you are lessening the amplification of someone. You play a role. You're part of the media. That's a good thing. You play a role here. And so the flip side is we are also complicit for the messages that we share. However small, you and I don't have the reach of CNN and Fox, obviously. And if you do, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. But probably not. Um, but we have a role. We have a responsibility, just like with anything we do. What you put in your yard, what you put on your car, what you dress your kids, you know, you made that choice. And so we have a role. You are empowered. You participate. Which, again, the corollary to that is there's responsibility in thinking about how you participate. You're not just this invisible thing out there clicking and posting whatever. You, should, you play a role. Every time you watch that particular TikToker or whatever, you're amplifying their signal. You're amplifying that. You play a role. We are part of that. And that has strengths and weaknesses to it. So here's two definitions I want to talk about with regard to our sharks and lots of other stuff. Misinformation and disinformation. Who is familiar with either or both of these terms? We talk about misinformation. Good man, what's misinformation? I know it's on the screen. What do you think it is? Yeah, okay. So what's, what would disinformation be? Again, I know it's on the screen. What would disinformation be compared to misinformation? Oh, I like that. Yeah, there's purpose behind it. Misinformation is when you see that Denzel Washington died in your feed and you share it. You say, guys, Denzel Washington died. And then you find out, no, he didn't. Uh, there's so many celebrities that have died so many times out there. Uh, because that's not because we're ghouls, but celebrity deaths are one of the most commonly shared things that have nothing to do with politics or anything like that. It's just, hey, did you know he died? The more surprising the celebrity, the more likely it is to get reshared, reshared, reshared. Uh, Robin Williams died many times before he died. Um, disinformation, talking about that purpose, which I love that, is false information that intends to deceive. Misinformation can deceive, will deceive also potentially, but it's not intended to deceive. Now here's the thing. Here's our shark friend again. Who are we always in the shark picture is fake? Disinformers share that shark picture to trick people. Oh, it's gone. That wasn't intentional. <laughs> I'll, I'll pretend that was for emphasis. Misinformers share the fake shark picture because they think it's real. And they want to tell other people that. Do you see the difference between the two pictures? No, <laughs> there's no difference. It's the same picture. I copy pasted it. The intention is important to know, but it doesn't matter because it's still false information out there. Why did I tell you that? It does matter to understand we're thinking about why might this be happening. It's important to know that, but it's still, at the end of the day, incorrect information or false information that's out there. I don't use the word fake news for a lot of reasons. It's non-descriptive. It's loaded. It's not useful. Misinformation and disinformation here are useful. Most of you, if you shared false stuff up here, I'm going to assume the best of everyone in here assumes the misinformation. Whoops. Thought that was real. Filled it in my heart parts and shared it and then realized, oh, it wasn't. And then you might have followed up and said, sorry, it was fake or got belligerent about it or whatever. Disinformation is like, I'm going to go out and fool somebody today uh, and trick them. And hopefully that's not. Um, that's why we always assume the shark picture is fake, not sharks, literally. That thing we want to believe, assume it's fake until you can take a second and check it out. The more strongly you want to believe it, the more caution you have to provide to it. Um, Here's a case study for us. So again, I teach at WVU. We have a partnership with PolitiFact. Anybody ever read PolitiFact before? It's one of the, the major fact-checking sites out there. There's lots of other ones. It's one of the big ones. They won Pulitzer Prize. They've partnered with us since 2016. Every every fall, my students are involved with this. They do individual fact checks. They go uh, things. They'll get bylines on there, which is pretty cool for them. And they issue a ruling range ranging from true to pants on fire. Um, there's like true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, and pants on fire, which is just like crazy stuff. We've got a couple of them in there. They're, they're fun to search by, but they're not common. Um, just, I believe, a year ago, uh, we had a local one that we got to check, which was that um, this is this was during, sorry, this is a couple years ago, 2021, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the rumor went around that a truck carrying Moderna vaccine crashed on the, on the uh, Cheat Lake Bridge, if you've ever been to Morgantown, 
uh, the bridge that goes over Cheat Lake. Um, and the Pentagon handled this recovery. And we fact checked that. And here's the thing what came out of that? So, again, here's the original tweet from Tim Poole, who's a local podcaster who's reputable and informed, not some crank. Like, this is the person that people in our area count on for news and is a reliable person and shared this. These are indicators that this is probably, well, if this is fake, it's probably not an intentional fake. But let's see, what we came out with was half true ruling this. Um, it's true that a hazmat truck flipped over. It's true that it was carrying Moderna vaccines. Crashed on the Cheat Lake Bridge, the hazmat crew was called out to clean up debris. That's all true. Those things all happened. Our, our Cheat Lake Bridge was blocked all the time. Um, you understand that because you're in a heavy bridge town. You know what that's like. Um, but we were content with that because as humans, we like a good story. That's why conspiracy theories stick. Because the idea that even if they're bad things, that the bad things happen in the world are connected, that somebody's behind them, is more satisfying to us than that sometimes bad things happen. And so we love it when somebody tells us there's got to be more to that story. And this is that emotional pull. Um, it was not true that the airspace was shut down. It was not true that the Department of Defense was dispatched to the site. Um, it was all local. Those parts were false. And you see what turned out to be false in this very, for the most part, the details, the initial details of the story were true. And yet, what was false was the things that made it a better story, were the things that put the shark in the middle of the highway. The hurricane did happen. The tropical storm did happen. But that wasn't enough because it wasn't a good enough story. We have hurricanes all the time. How often do you see sharks in the highway? This truck turned over and it was a bad thing and it was a true story with lots of unfortunate details. We did not call in the government and have a cover up and have Department of Defense handle and that kind of thing. That's the feeling part of this. It's not saying that couldn't happen, but it was very easy for a misinformed story to blow out of proportion because we're inclined to believe those more sordid details. Once again, it's not saying that never happens, but we're getting into wanting something to be true. Not because we want bad things to happen, because it's a better story that way. That's a very human thing. It's got nothing to do with ideology, party, anything like that. Everything to do with being a human person that believes things. We like stories. Um, if you want to see the fact checks we've done, you can search PolitiFact West Virginia. You'll get our page. You can see all the work that our students have done. Most of our claims, about a third of them, have been mostly true. Um, most of the stuff, and that means that there's a grain of something that doesn't quite check out. It's not a lie or anything like that, but like, oh, they fudged it a little bit, which I, it may surprise you to learn that politicians often fudge details to make things look more positive that benefit. They, that may surprise you. I don't want to shock anybody here today. Um, but only one vote, only one percent of uh, pants on fire. I mean, most of our checks were mostly true, and a quarter of them were true. Because, yeah, um, it's important to keep in mind not to be naive and just trusting about everything, but understand that, like, when you find yourself wanting, feeling that belief, that's why we check. Um, uh, let's go through. So, we're going to talk a little bit about where persuasion comes from. We're going to talk about a dead Greek guy to do this because why not? Uh, you've heard of Aristotle, don't worry, we're not going too far down the class as well. But one useful thing that Aristotle gives us that is still something we talk about in the Greek philosopher, uh, that's still useful when we think about persuasion, are routes to persuasion. There's three big ones. You can parse it and slice them everyone. But at the end of the day, if you go listen to ads or persuasive appeals made by politicians or people that just want to convince you to buy that car or whatever, they generally fall into three categories. Ethos, logos, and pathos. We'll set aside the Greek in just a moment here. But broadly, we're talking about what they're appealing to, to get you to buy that car, believe that thing, do that, whatever. Uh, these are standard tools of persuasion. They're pretty timely, despite being come up with back centuries ago. Our first is ethos. Ethos is about source credibility. This is saying, I'm trying to persuade you based on where this claim is coming from. If you recall the 1990s, Michael Jordan, best basketball player in the world, and the man's face was on everything. Batteries, underwear, car rentals, excellent basketball player. I am not convinced that means Michael Jordan knows anything about AA batteries. But he was the he was the Rayo Vag pitchman for a long time. Haynes underwear. He saw Michael Jordan in his underwear more than certain family members, probably. Um, not because he knows anything about underwear, but because this is an ethos appeal. Hey, this guy you know, he thinks you should buy this. And that's not because we're stupid but because we tend to have a positive association with people we know and have a have generally a good basketball player unless you hated the Bulls. 
Um, even then, you'd probably recognize he was a good player. We tend that 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 reservoir of positive emotion tends to slop over into other things. That's good. To go back farther, old cigarette ads. A common thing. This isn't even a real person. Would do things like, hey, this picture of a doctor says you should smoke. Uh, four to five pictures of doctors say you should smoke. This dentist picture says you should smoke. That's an ethos appeal. Saying this person who knows about health, he says smoke up. And that's a common thing. That's that's an ethos appeal. It's saying person who is either knowledgeable or just well known says do the thing. That's an ethos appeal. You can think of that. Anytime a celebrity's in an ad, anytime an expert's in an ad, this is it's at least in part an ethos appeal. Um, great example. Here's me. I am a doctor. This is true. I have a PhD, University of Missouri, 2008, doctor of philosophy. That means I can legit put doctor in front of my name. That's not putting on airs. That's correct. If I tell my students to call me Dr. Britton, I'm not getting a big head about it. That is accurate. Generally, I don't. It goes with me, but, I, but I don't. It does not mean you want me operating on you. No. If you're on an airplane and they say there's there a doctor on the airplane and I stand up, you just put your hand on my shoulder and put me back down. Because unless they want to know about memory making in Shanksville, Pennsylvania after Flight 93, which is what my dissertation was on, that's, uh, this is not my bag. Um, so why then talking about this for an ethos appeal? If you're reading an article, I just told you about my dissertation, that says, here's a quote, even though residents of Shanksville have been maintaining and archiving their memorial artifacts from the Flight 93 crash for years, they describe their work as less real than that of an official uh, memorial. That said Dr. Britton, it's a legitimate use of the doctor in front of my name because that's what I study. That's something in the area I have expertise in, collective memory and media. Um, this is what I research. You can find ample evidence. It's very verifiable. But yeah, he's a doctor of that thing. He knows about that thing. If you read an article that says, based on my observation, the coronavirus is likely to fade away like other epidemics, said Dr. Britton, it's just not something we have to worry about anymore. I am not a virologist or an epidemiologist. And the quote doesn't claim that I am, but it's making an ethos appeal. It says, well, this guy's a doctor. He said it. Nowhere in there does it say epidemiologist, virologist, anything like that. But it makes sure that doctor's in there. Dr. Britton says this. Uh, yeah, but Dr. Britton doesn't know about this. That's an ethos appeal. And it's a misleading ethos appeal. What I'm trying to show for each one of these is how these appeals are used to persuade in good faith and less good faith ways. Um, and this isn't just something you'd see from a propagandist. Uh, we love credentials. We love to put that thing out front and say, like, hey, this guy's a doctor. He knows about it. Well, maybe, maybe not. What kind of doctor is issue? Logos is our second one. Logical argument. This is not the only example, but it's a good one. Facts and figures is your logos appeal. Car insurance ads. This is why they busted out like geckos and cartoon characters, because car insurance is apparently boring. <laughs> Um, but their ads are often based in logos appeals. Here's all the facts about why you should use us instead of them. Their parody project product, most of them are pretty much the same, so they got to set it apart somewhere. So thus, you know, geckos. Uh, PSA is like about smoking or whatever. These are often logos appeals. Uh, information graphics are things we often trust because they're not photos, but they often feel more, and I, I teach information graphics, but they, they tend to look more objective, and they tend to be based on facts. This is from uh, last fall, um, the, the wildfires in Hawaii. This is a map of which buildings were destroyed in that. It's compelling logos appeal because it shows us all those red buildings show you where buildings were that got burned in the wildfires. That's a facts-based appeal. It says, were they bad? Sure looks like it. And this is for real. Um, this is from the Washington Post. Uh, this is the actual headline of the story. Who's more likely to smoke weed and is it NPR listeners? Um, as we see over time that aging in America is becoming I mean, a chronic condition, very funny. Of each group, who the share who said they never used marijuana, we see certain groups that have been pretty, you know, pretty consistent since 2009. But over that past decade plus, groups in 65 or older, that has increased steadily over time compared to the other groups which have been consistent. That's a facts and figures appeal. That's saying, hey, this thing is changing. Here's the numbers that show it. And they tell you where it came from. The National Survey on Drug Use and Health from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. That's useful. But this is a logos appeal too, based on facts and figures. Have you ever heard the phrase correlation does not equal causation? Here's a doozy. This is from a site I love. It. It's called Spurious Correlations. Um, the correlation, two lines, this is all real data. Between over the years, the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool, that's the red line, and the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in each year, that's the black line. <laughs> and you can see they correlate. That is true. That is not a lie. They correlate very well. That does not mean that Nicolas Cage studies and stop being in movies because people are dying. At least outside the movie. That's those are different things. The classic example is every summer, it will not shock you to learn that ice cream consumption goes up. 
And every summer, it probably won't shock you to learn that the rate of murder goes up. These are both true statements. But that doesn't even include eating ice cream leads to murder. That's a false correlation. Or that's a false causation. A or spurious causation is what you call it. Those things absolutely go up and down at the same time. Why do you think they both go up in the summertime? It's hot. When it's hot, we eat ice cream. And when it's hot, we get cranky. And we're around other people that get on our nerves. That's being a little bit glib about it. But yeah, there's a third variable here. And yet we're inclined. We like a good story. Because man, what a good story that is. Nicholas Cage movies lead to drowning in pools. That's a compelling story. That's a highway shark right there. There's that emotional pull again. Logos plus the one we're going to talk about in a minute. And because we often gloss over charts, it's easy to miss stuff. Like this is one that shows people's reactions to natural versus synthetic diamonds. The percentage of people that think that find blue is the natural perception, that find natural diamonds authentic or romantic or special versus lab grown diamonds in the black one. Clearly, people prefer natural diamonds. Any issues with this chart? The numbers are completely legitimate. I realize my screen's a little bummed. You should be able to see this. Any possible issues with where this data comes from? Yeah, what's De Beers? Uh, yeah, De Beers is like the largest diamond company in the world. Now, on the one hand, let's be fair. This is just a warning sign. Do you think the largest diamond company in the world knows something about diamonds? Probably. Do you think they have maybe a vested interest in people wanting natural diamonds, which is their business? Yeah, so it doesn't mean this is a lie. But it does mean, and this is where things get squishy, there's not always a bright line, where we should maybe put the brakes on. Because this is a heck of a story. Big bar versus small bar is always a good story. But considering where it comes from, we should maybe put the brakes on and say, oh, are there other sources that might back this up? Is what I would want to ask next. It doesn't mean this is false. It means what else can corroborate this? And one more. Things are getting a little racy here, so, you know, check your heart rate. Um, but this last one. Now, again, you might not catch this one. This is from a, a study a while back uh, that, uh, uh, which we call it, BuzzFeed did in conjunction with uh, the the Port Pornhub, which is the uh, country's largest uh, pornography site. So, again, yeah, it's a little raciness for your Tuesday. Uh, but they have data, anonymized data, on who uses their site and what states they're from. What do you find compelling? This comparison of uh, Republican based on which which presidential candidate they voted for in 2016. Um, a comparison between pornography consumption per capita in red states versus blue states. You notice Kansas up there, top of the red list, far and away, longer than everybody else. Now, here's the thing. And again, this is why I say check yourself, don't automatically disbelieve stuff. That's a good story. That any one state would stand out, and particularly Kansas, and I don't mean to slag on Kansas, although I went to uh, grad school in Missouri, so it's kind of, I'm kind of obligated to slag on Kansas. But even setting that aside, you know, it's a good story because, like, when we think of Kansas, you're likely to think of you know, the heartland, corn, flatness, that kind of thing, like farms, that kind of thing. And the fact that all those farmers are inside watching pornography every night is a good story. That's a compelling story. We love contrasts. That's a good story. Um, and so we're inclined to believe this. This story took a lot of, you know, you can also compare the overall rate of consumption. The average rate for, uh, for Democrats was uh, 150. Is that third? No, 137 versus 121 for Republicans. So you can also take away that the average rate for Democrats is higher than Republicans. There's lots of take so That Kansas bar really stands out. Except here's the thing. I'll get a little inside baseball with you here before. And we don't know this for a fact, but it's pretty compelling. That most of us don't have geolocation turned on on our phones. Either it defaults like that or we turn it off. And even if we do, geolocation, identifying what state you're in when you use your phone, is really dodgy. Like it's not well tracked. And when you're tracking geolocation and you can't identify a specific state or a specific location, what it does is it defaults to the center of the area that you're in. Any guesses where the center of the United States is? Yeah. So all the pornography hits that couldn't be tracked to a state defaulted to the center, the geographical center of the United States, which just so happens to be No, good, that's not his fault. <laughs> but that, that's a logos appeal, and it can be used to tell the truth, and it can be used to mislead intentionally, or in this case, not intentionally. But man, what a good story. Oh, those Kansans. Um, it's a desire to muscle, which brings us once again to our third appeal, which always comes back to his pathos. And the pathos appeal 
It's appeal to the feelings. It is an appeal of that, in most cases, it's an emotional appeal, and in many cases, bypasses thought. It's not saying it's a bad thing for them, I want to be clear, but it's one of the most common offenders. So if we want to get people to slow down, we show, in a very stylized way, you know, that's a, a, a kid with a crash test on the head, uh, dented into an accident. You know, we show something that's going to make us feel like, oh my God, I won't, I won't do harm to you by clicking on this and showing this video, but if you've ever seen the ASPCA ads with Sarah McLaughlin, Playing the sad music, and if you watch that and don't want to go out and adopt twelve dogs, then I can't help you as a person. But that's a pathos appeal. That's an emotional appeal. Saying do you feel this, do you feel these suffering dogs? This is what's happening. Please contribute to the cause. They're hugely effective, and they're pathos appeal. There's nothing wrong with the pathos appeal. Making you feel something about a cause to persuade you to action is a, is a time old standard. When you catch yourself feeling the information. Doesn't mean it's a lie, doesn't mean it's a trick, does mean hit the brakes, does mean slow down, does mean, hold up, even if they're not trying to trick you, if you're feeling, you may not be thinking. If you're not thinking, you may not be acting as your best self, and that's the thing. So if it's about that guy you don't like, or that guy you do like, you may be more inclined to share or not share that information without checking it out, just because it's the guy I like or the guy I don't like, or the cause I like, the cause I don't like. If you hate the New England Patriots and you see a story about them cheating, you might be more inclined to share it than if you love them or you don't have an opinion about the New England Patriots. Uh, and that story may turn out to be true, false, or perhaps just overblown. Um, you've experienced this. All right, the football's my mind because I'm a Bills fan and I just had to go through that. I mean, this is why you don't watch the Bills. You don't watch the Bills in the postseason because you know better. I lived through four failed Super Bowls in a row. You know, just I don't watch the postseason games. That's exactly why. Sorry, off topic. Anyway, um, and talking about pathos, yeah, Hurricane Shark is pathos because that's a story you want to believe because it's a good story. Keep coming back to that. The person you don't like doing something outrageously stupid is not impossible, but it's also something you want to believe. The flip side of that, of course, is the person you don't like making an excellent point is something you don't want to believe. You emotionally don't want to believe, so you'd be less likely to share that information, even if it's true. And I'm being vague purposely, because that's true of what we're talking about. The president down dog catcher. Why is it always dog catcher? You don't vote for it. Anyways. <clears throat> and so what we do is not learn everything about everything, because you can't do that. I can't do that. You can't do that. We can. So we build a toolbox. We have a way of thinking about what can we use. First of all, first tool, element in that toolbox is that recognize that emotional pull and say, hey, I want to believe this is true. So that's a sign I should stop for a second and see is anybody else reporting on this, whatever. But we got some concrete stuff we can use too. That emotional pull is always our, is our, is our gut reaction. Let, let's keep going. Um, there's lots of things you can put in your toolbox. And none of them works in every situation. The same as if you have a toolbox with one hammer on it, one hammer in it, that's not a good toolbox. That's a hammer. Uh, you're not screwing anything in with that hammer. Um, fact checking sites like we've talked about PolitiFact's great, factcheck.org, Open Secrets, Truth of Fiction, Washington Post Fact Checker, lots of others, debunking resources, Snopes, Hoax Slayer, whatever, uh, visual tools, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I have a guide to that that I put up as well because visual disinformation is particularly common. Um, I want to be very clear in no case am I saying this one site, your one stop shop, because it's not. They might not have checked that thing, they might have made a mistake. There might just be more that needs to be checked. The point is we have a toolbox. We're looking for corroborating evidence. Are there things that support or deny? Are there more or less red flags? Um, my father is on Twitter. He's posted three times in his life. Um, his posts in his account have all the hallmarks of a Twitter spammer, a false account. I assure you he is not because I know him. He is a real person who just doesn't use He posted three times and then got bored with it. He has many red flags on his account because of that. But he's, there's nothing illegitimate about that account. So just because the red flag's there doesn't mean automatically stop. We're looking for preponderance of evidence. We're looking for lots of instances of holes. The, the point is we stop, we don't share immediately, which is really hard because the online environment is wired to get us to share immediately. Uh, but none of these tools are, are perfect, just like none of your tools are perfect. So a couple things we can do, a couple tools we can use. About us pages and profiles. We're assuming we're looking at online information here. But even if it's on paper, somebody hands you something in, uh, somebody hands you a newspaper on the street, check and see where it's from. 
Every site should have an about us page uh, on social media. Every profile page should have some information. Do they have one? Is an actual name attached to it or some kind of identifying information? Can you contact the person or the site? Does it say, in the case of a new site, who pays their bills? Was the account just created? It doesn't mean that something's new is automatically a liar, but it's definitely a warning thing. Um, if you go to the Washington Post, and I don't like that you have to scroll so far for this, but it's typical, unfortunately. You go to the Washington Post page and scroll all the way to the bottom, and you click about the post right here. It takes you here and it shows you who the leadership is in the post. Opinion and management um, have different pages as well. So there's lots of leaders, lots of people who are accountable for information that's posted there. It's not saying the post never gets it wrong, it's that there's lots of people who are on the hook for if they do. The Daily Athenaeum, this is the student newspaper at WBU, has the same thing. You click home, you go to their About Us page, and you can see this is their current editorial staff, changes every year. Uh, these are all students, they have their contact information, these are real people. You can find out these are real people and where they're coming from. It doesn't mean trust everything they say, but they're accountable, that's what we're looking for. When people make claims, are they accountable to some extent? It's trickier with social media accounts, but it's still there. Is there somebody behind the curtain that we can talk to, that we can point to and say, yeah, they've said other things that are reliable. Uh, parody sites, if you're familiar with The Onion, I just screenshotted some of the most recent stuff on The Onion. This is actually from a little while ago because they're posted. Just, if you're not familiar with The Onion, it's a, sat it's a parody site. It's a parody and satire site. And the stories they put up are not real. So does that make it misinformation or disinformation? Well, it depends. Uh, here's what, if you go to The Onion's About Us page, which they have, which is a good sign, among other things, there's a blank that says, what if I want to sue The Onion? And they say, please don't do that. We are satire. This is what we do. They are very clear that this is not a real thing and you should not take this as a real thing. So in terms of intention, in terms of action, no, the onion is not de facto misinformation or disinformation. At the same time, just like our shark picture, what matters is how it gets used. So here's an example. This is an old example. Uh, but going way back, 2002, ancient times, this is a real thing. So the only part of the story, this is Congress threatens to leave DC unless the new capital is built. It's like a pro sports team. They wanted a retractable dome. Uh, this is a made up story from the onion. Um, the Chinese state, one well, of the Chinese state newspaper, the Beijing Evening News, shared this widely in, throughout China as evidence of the decadence of the West. A, a, a government of one of the largest countries in the world, most powerful countries in the world, their state run media shared the onion story and said, look at these filthy Westerners, this kind of thing. And that doesn't mean that people or governments can't use something that is very clear that it's made up to spread this information. So ultimately it's the use of the thing, how you're sharing. People would share completely legitimate news as examples of things that are not true. Uh, a couple of years back when the Patriots, uh, what, the, I think the last time the Patriots won the Super Bowl, people shared an image of them in front of the White House um, and then they shared the image of the previous time they won during the Obama administration, where a much larger crowd was there. And they shared those evidence that uh, Patriots disapproved of then President Trump. And that's not true. Uh, the second picture only included members of the team. The Obama picture included members of the staff and all kinds of people. So while there were people who chose not to come, these two completely true and newsworthy pictures were of two different things. And yet, the way they're presented side by side made it look like, see, they, people didn't want to come to this, and that's not true. At least not with how it's being represented. Um, it's how we use it. This, once again, sad but true, this comes back on us. How we share the thing, never mind what the news organizations do, how we share the information is ultimately what gets out. And not letting yourself get pulled in by that emotional pull is where media literacy and your own action starts. It's not what can we do about these organizations, it's what can I do about me. It doesn't fix everything but you are the media too. Like I said, social media profiles are a tool. And check that simple as click the profile. If you see something by somebody you've never heard of before, just click and see who they are. When they created the account, have they ever posted before or did they literally create the account today and share this wild and crazy thing? Because I don't know about you, but a guy who walks up to me on the street that I've never met before and said, hey, did you hear the White House is on fire? I might be inclined to hesitate to believe that person. And yet online, we can often jump at it because, hey, what a story. Going back to our shark example, click on the profile. Big Cat is Dan Katz, who writes for Barstool Sports. He regularly posts legit sports information. He also regularly posts jokes and satire. 
That's a warning sign. This could be a joke because this person often posts jokes. That doesn't mean this person's evil. It means know who you're getting information from. So it's a guy who posts jokes. It probably is a joke, especially since in the responses, some of the responses people did, I get read through, we're clearly in on the joke because people responded to it by posting other images of sharks saying, look what happened during the hurricane. None of these actually for, are from the hurricane. It's a joke. It's very clear. The context makes it a joke. You owe it to yourself to people that trust you enough to let you into their feet to take the two seconds. And if you don't have the time, then don't share anything. It's fine. I'm not yelling at you. Huh? This is a human thing. We do this. Because I want to believe that thing's true because what a story. Or man, it makes that guy look good. Or man, it makes that guy look bad. All kinds of profiles that we can, that we can pay attention to. What do we know about the profile? Is it new? Brand new is often a warning sign. Do they post about non-political subjects or are they just posting you know, boilerplate stuff? Uh, spelling and grammar, that's a weird one because we all make spelling mistakes, but there's a certain consistency to spelling errors in fake accounts. And again, it's one red flag to add to the pile. If you have a bunch of them, that's a bigger warning sign. Uh, one thing which we'll get into in a minute, could you image search the profile picture? Fake accounts love to uh, grab somebody else's profile picture and put it on. Sometimes you have pictures from their Facebook page and put them on so they look real if you do a cursory search. If you can find that profile picture somewhere else, yeah, that's definitely fake or a stock picture. Um, hang on just a second. I'm going to skip through a couple of these this morning. I wanted to get to something else. Hang on. Here's a tool uh, that you can use that you have already. Nothing to download here. Uh, this is something that if you ever use Google, you can use this tool. Uh, who's, is it, are any of you familiar with reverse image search? Usually there's a couple. Uh, this is something you can use right now. If you go to Google, and if you found an image that seems compelling, that, huh, man, that picture of that hot shark swimming on a highway, it seems like a good story. You can check it out and see if this has appeared. It won't always be the case, but it hasn't appeared somewhere else. If you save the image's URL, the web address from the top of the screen, from that image particular, and you go to images.google.com, there's the address. You click the camera icon in the search bar, and you paste the image in there. It'll show you where else that image has showed up. You can also download the image and literally drag it into the search field, just like this, and it'll show you. When I search for, uh, this is from, again, from August this year, I, I try to search. When I search for highway shark, it gives me references. It gives me those recent ones up top here. It gives me a Snopes link. It talks about where else. If you scroll down, you'll see all the other places these pictures appear. Uh, and pictures are great examples of paid those appeals because when you see something, it's cliche to say seeing is believing. But you see something that's a good story. I mean, yeah, I want to believe that because it's a good story. Um, way back during Hurricane Harvey, 2017, this guy's uh, Scottish journalist journalist uh, shared the highway, highway shark. And it wasn't even the first time. And it got shared huge list, 5,000 likes. And that was from 2017. Um, you saw one of the hits that came up was Snopes. Snopes is a great page. I know I have people that tell me, like, oh, Snopes is biased. Here's the thing. Again, no source is perfect. Snopes, Snopes is a good source, Snopes.com, because they show you all their sources. They will tell you where their information came from. And that's what my bias is towards. Do they tell me where the information came from? Uh, and they do. They will show you where it came from. Case in point, um, here's how they covered the uh, hurricane shark story. Not only is it fake, they found where the picture of the shark originally comes from. Uh, Nature Magazine from, I want to say, 2005. Of a kayak. That's that's horrifying. Look at that picture. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's the same shark. And they tracked it down and they showed you where it came from. They linked to it. Any source that shows its sources and they're good sources or they're legitimate sources, that's a keeper. That's something you want to hang on to. Uh, I also like Snopes because they don't hide the answers when you're saying, is this thing fake? Most of their headlines tell you without having to even read the story. At a loss to clicks for them. Uh, whether the thing is real or is not. Biden did not fall asleep while meeting with Maul Maui fire victims. Uh, did Zelensky say something? We're still questions. Video does not show Dodger Stadium flooded after tropical storm Hillary. Disney is not ending Disney Plus. There's no evidence Ivana Trump was cremated. Uh, it's right there. And then you can click through the story and actually read how they prove or debunk that story. I like that because they are focusing on service rather than, hey, you have to click to find out the truth. I like that a lot. And then if you go in, they will show you the evidence for the thing. So, what do we do with all this? Oh my God. Um, what we want to avoid is that feeling of like, there's just too much. Or I've got to stop the bad actors. That's only part of it. 
like we said from the beginning, you are a media, you're a member of the media. You post, you provide information, you are sharing information. Anytime you post something to more than texting your son or your husband or whatever. Anytime you are sharing to an audience on social media or whatever, um, even email to an extent. Email forwards, you're not off the hook. Um, you are speaking to an audience. What do we do? Well, we want to develop that sense of smell. We talked about three different appeals. They can all be misused. Emotional appeals, though, in particular. If you feel the pull, just develop that one. If nothing else, get that feeling of identifying what a want feels like. If I want to believe that's true, hit the brakes. What can I do to make sure that's true before I share it? And if that means, oh, I don't have the time for it, well, then you probably don't need to be sharing it at all. Because nothing needs to be shared right now other than, hey, your house is on fire, which I assume you verified. Um, you won't have tools. You won't have good habits. The point is not you have to do all these things. The point is if you do a couple of these things here and there, if you check things out rather than just go with that gut feel, you're on the right track. Just people say, this is why I shared it, and it's more than because I wanted to be true, because I felt it was true. And we want to remember the shark picture is always fake. Again, metaphorically, the shark picture is always fake, except when it's because I don't know if you recall, and I've linked this, uh, and this is not um, the screen I have, but actually this is from the Washington Post from, I believe, oh, 2022, after Hurricane Ian. This is documented, verified footage that a user sent in of a flooded golf course that a shark swam onto and having a marvelous time flipping around and just swimming around on a golf course. That's real. There's no always, there's no nevers, other than always check it out and never trust an always, which is unbelievable. But the whole point is, yeah, even an amazing story can sometimes be true. Uh, but in all cases, and if you read this story, which I do have linked, the Washington Post tells how they've edited. They got corroborating evidence. They talked to the person who sent the video. They saw it for themselves. Yeah, this is real. So sometimes the shark picture is real too, but that's not the way to bet. So that's what I got for you. Um, what I have linked here is if you are a QR code inclined person, you want to take a picture of that. What I've got is a folder with three things. It's got the slideshow, it's got a media literacy tip sheet, and it's got a quick guide uh, to how to do a reverse image search. That's just resources. I like to share resources uh, because I don't take notes during a lot of presentations. And it's stuff you'd like to hang on to, it's something you got. But that's up on Google Drive. So if you have the QR code, this is um, that's an unfortunate color. Of it. Um, but um, I have a bit new link up there even right now. But I'm happy to share that uh, through Sean. What else do I have? Um, any questions? Anything we can talk about? We got some time here. Yeah. This is Leo and Central's media and pop culture. Awesome. So before we came out here, I showed them a picture of a shark attacking another one. It's always a shark. <laughs> it's always a shark is like just the, the poster child for media literacy. Because like it's it sharks like the, the, the epitome of like an extreme thing. You know, I mean shark NATO, it, it wasn't ferret NATO for a reason. Like it, it's yeah. Good. <laughs> Yeah. That's not worth it. I feel like that's not really um, benefiting or giving like anything that anyone has a kind of like a joke and like show. So why would you put that out there? Like, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's like, why even do this? This isn't serving some kind of end. Well, the example that I gave for the, uh, the, the in Hurricane Harvey in 2017, that Scottish journalist, huge engagement. Uh, a bunch of people, even people found out that it wasn't real. A lot of people followed him. A lot of people retweeted him. That ups his brand, that ups his visibility. There's that. There's also, and you've experienced this, people that do it for the walls. I do it because I want to make other people look stupid. There's people that are that just want to see it burn. And that's unpleasant, but that's real. And there's people that see it as a stepping stone. There's people that want to fool people. I mean, there's weird. And then if you get into more targeted things like making a particular candidate look bad, now you've got other motivations as well. But there's also, and there's an additional thing, which is, you hate to get tinfoil hatty about this, but the other thing is there's an interest in quarters of our of our media environment in just destabilizing the information environment and making it so we don't trust information as much. Now, there's something good to that. That's what I just talked about. Don't trust things on their face. And yet, take it to its extreme. There's no absolutes here. The idea of like, well, you can't trust anything is a good way to shut you down. And it's a good way to make you stop thinking. So look, everything's fake, so just go with what you feel, which is the exact opposite of what we're talking about here. If you can't believe anything, then just go with your gut, which is not where you want to be. And starting point should be at any point. Yeah. Also what you said, look at the like uh pays for the um mediums that they post. So does that mean like if you're looking at a certain site and it's funded by a group of people who are 
like a pro abortion or something like that, that may be more, may be more uh, the information that they post be more leaning towards that, or of course, be kind of like Possibly. It's just like the De Beers example with the diamonds. De Beers knows about diamonds. They're a legitimate source of information about diamonds. And yet it's also, so that's true. It's also true that they have a vested interest in making sure that natural, whoa, swing nothing around, that natural, for emphasis, uh, that natural diamonds are viewed better than synthetic diamonds because they lose money. That's true too. It doesn't mean trust, absolutely trust or don't trust. It means stop and think about it. What else is here? That makes me ask questions. Can I find other sources? So, going to your point about, um, I've been using. I use multiple examples from the Washington Post today. Do we know who owns the Washington Post? And what else does Jeff Bezos own? Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. And if the Washington Post ever mentions, you'll see if you read the post. Anytime they mention Amazon, they say anything about Amazon. If they're covering it or they mention a story, they put in parentheses after the mention. Washington Post is owned by Amazon owner Jeff Bezos. Uh, that kind of, they always try to be transparent about that. I cannot know if Jeff Bezos ever gets on the phone with the Washington Post and says, you can't run that critical story about Amazon. Generally, he sh generally the evidence seems to suggest that he does not do that kind of thing, that he tries to stay pretty hands off. And yet, there's an interest there. The same as with the beers. It doesn't mean, so absolutely don't trust any of their coverage about Amazon. It just means you should know that even if they say that, that Amazon, is involved with how they get their bills paid. If you listen to NPR, they try to be as transparent as possible about that. They try to say if they're writing something about Bill Gates, they'll they'll add in the story that you know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation underwrites NPR program. They try to be transparent. Nobody's going to be perfect, but how clear are they about how they pay for it? Now again, there's cases where it's going to be a bright line between hey, this group is anti this, and this story is about why the thing they're against is bad. That might not be a good thing. They might just be overtly saying hey, write this bad story. Um, the first step, though, is just being aware of who owns the thing and what do we know about what role they take in it. It doesn't mean that it's automatically bad. It means we should know. And if we can't be bothered to know, then why are you staring the story? I know it feels like extra work, um, but we should know. Go ahead. So last one for this No, no, talk. Oh, Questions so are good. So in the example where you put yourself as a doctor, no, 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 no,
and a robocall went out. It's already a scary word, right? You know, automated call went out that sounds like it claims to be Joe Biden. It sounds like Joe Biden saying, hey, don't go out. And, there, there's a campaign that write him in as a candidate. That is true. That's a real thing. And this robocall went out with his voice on it saying, hey, don't actually write me and I don't want you to do that. And it's not Joe Biden's voice. And again, there's certain tells, but it's, it's gotten tricky. And this is part of why um, in the AI section, what they're trying to do is get um, AI creators to, to put watermarks on their work, digital watermarks that are identifiable uh, so that you can see that in string ones and zeros and evidence that this was generated rather than actually recorded. But yeah, it's tricky. And to go back to your question about why would somebody share a picture of a shark swimming on the highway, where do they get out of that? Well, the same thing as this. It's not, I mean, sure, it benefits them if people don't go out, benefit people who don't want people to vote for Joe Biden to tell you not to go out and vote for Joe Biden. That's a direct line. But also, if we get the world to a point where you can't trust anybody, then all you have to trust are the people that you feel are right. The people like, well, I like that guy, so I guess I'll go with him because you can't trust the media. Although you established you are the media. And creating that kind of environment serves. Uh, as well. And again, I don't mean to get that as a conspiracy theory minded kind of thing. That's just factual. The idea that making it so you don't trust anybody except for me is good for me. So the question you want to ask is who does it serve? Who would it serve if this kind of thing happens? And that's a way, just like that emotional check, that's a way to put those brakes on. Just stop and think for a minute. Doesn't mean it's false. Just a check. Go ahead. So AI thinks like, thinks it may look like like there's this thing like a week ago where they said there's aliens at the Miami Bar or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there were videos going around of like actual like big like ten foot tall creatures like walking around. Sure. So how are you supposed to be able to differentiate between like the video is real yep. and off, especially like a voice? Yep. Like they're able to make it sound so much like the divide, how you uh, differentiate mm -hmm. Well, step one is that check. We're like, you know, what am I feeling here? So that's our check to stop, you know, so again, that doesn't solve everything, but that gives an idea of, well, I should check this out. Step two is looking for corroborating sources. Am I seeing this anywhere else? Now that's tricky because somebody is always gonna be the one to break the news. The news came from one source first. And sometimes you can only find something in one place because that's the people who found it first and nobody's had a chance to follow up on it. That's true. And if you feel like, well, there's only one source, so I wanna share it, so I'm first. Well, then you're not really serving the cause of information now, are you? So if you don't find anything that corroborates that, put the brakes on. Because the bigger it is, the, the, the phrase that always had leave me scratching my head is when people say, well, the media is not covering this. Well, where did you hear about it then? Because unless you were there, you, you heard about it from the media, man. Like, that's where you got it. Like, anytime somebody tells me the media is not covering this, I can come back with, like, 10 links usually, often from, like, CNN. The media is absolutely – or because it's crap, because it's made up and you can prove that it's made up. In that case – if aliens appeared at what you say it was Houston? Miami. Miami. Odds are there's going to be another story about that. I would think the Miami Herald would have an interest in covering aliens appearing in Miami. I just guess. I, I wager that's probably true. And so, you know, maybe take the five minutes and see, well, let's see in five minutes if that's because I, I, I doubt your fan base is like, I gotta see what Dave has to say about the Miami aliens. And so see, is it corroborated anywhere else? Can you back it up? Do you have a friend in Miami? Heck, maybe not. But is it showing up somewhere else? That doesn't mean always wait for other sources. You know, if it's a local thing, there's, it, it depends on where you're at. But the idea of like, where is it coming from? Is anybody else reporting this? And if they're not, or if they're all recently created sites, rather than, you know, something with a little bit more weight to it, a little bit more of a test of a, of a track record to it, maybe that's not something you want to be sharing with you. Um, again, doesn't mean the Miami aliens wouldn't show up in Miami. Absolutely. But something, the bigger it is, that's the other thing. The bigger it is, the more likely it is that you're going to see it somewhere else. And if you're not, eh, maybe don't click that shit. Anyways, that's what I got for you. Thanks for coming today.